Although we are inclined to think that prayer is so common a usage in our modern world that it needs no particular study or investigation, actually it is one of the most fascinating and little known subjects in the entire world of man's mental and religious life. The word prayer, coming, of course, from the Latin precari, means to entreat, to implore, or to beseech. Yet in practical usage, this has not been its meaning in a great many instances. And in order to focus the subject in our modern way of life, we need some background about the development man's concept of communication between himself, nature, spirit, divinity, power, and perhaps the deity itself. All of these stages and steps, all of these different attitudes are of concern to the anthropologist and the ethnologist, because they bear upon the rise of human culture. It is now generally acknowledged that we cannot be sure how and where and when religion as we know it first appeared in this world. We are not able to assume that it was merely a revelation at some time indicated uh, by the dating of ancient scriptures. We realize that it began as a psychological relationship between man and his world. A man's attitude toward the world around him has changed greatly in the course of ages. Yet in this world today, many of the older attitudes still survive, mingling in varying degrees with more recent interpretations. Nor do the old attitudes survive mostly among primitive people. They may appear in various colorings in all parts of our society, so that we are forced to consider them as factors here and now, in the interpretation of our spiritual existence. At a very ancient time, man came into conflict with nature. The conflict arose partly from the individuation that was arising in man, a process whereby he became the immediate manager of his own affairs, and the regularities, rhythms, and periodicities of natural order. Man wanted what he wanted when he wanted it. Nature did not exactly agree with this policy. Nature provided according to seasons and times. And natural processes were subject to certain irregularities certain inevitable interruptions or inconsistencies. It might be measured in terms of unseasonal weather, or the failure of water supply, or earthquakes, plagues, and pestilences. Man confronted not only with the rhythms of nature, but with these exceptional breaks in natural rhythm, he came to a degree exasperated. He was unhappy about the whole thing, and he began to conceive of ways and means by means of which he could force his own will upon nature, molding it not by his works, but by his words or his thoughts, and by magical formulas. At the very beginning, it seems that man's religious relationship with nature was a relationship with himself primarily. 
Thus, in primitive tribal custom, religious ritualism is what we would term non-directive. The rain dance calls for rain. It really does not care very much how the rain arrives or where it comes from. Ritual was man expressing his own needs, but not originally directing these needs toward any particular deity or any particular structure of religious uh, hierarchy or pattern. The individual seemingly expressed himself, relieved his own nature of certain anxiety, and he was addressing rain as rain, as though the water could hear him, as though the skies would listen. There was also, in many instances, not even a very reverent attitude in this primitive ritual. Some very simple statements can be found in the old rite, in which those wanting rain simply stood up and said, Rain, come, and waited, as though they had issued an order. On other occasions, they would say, Plague, go away. Well, apparently, Plague was better mannered than they were and did not listen to this type of conversation. It apparently wanted a more polite form. So as time went on, people didn't say any longer, Plague, go away. They might say, Father Plague, please leave us. Plague now became involved as a being. And antiquity inevitably personalized everything. Finally, rain became a being. Wind became a deity. In some parts of Asia, a rather sprightly gentleman with a large bag on his back filled with air. All these concepts became personalized. And the individual more and more addressed himself to the personifications of that. He spoke to rain as though it would answer, as though it understood, as though it could be affected by his thinking. In this level, we have a theological problem of considerable delicacy, because actually prayer can only be understood when we estimate the relationship between the person praying and the object to which the prayer is addressed. If man turns himself to an infinitely superior being, one who is all-knowing, one who possesses all power and all means for the accomplishment of ends, then man naturally addresses this superior, this infinite being, in a manner indicating human humility. We cannot force ourselves upon that which is infinitely greater than ourselves. We must petition. So if the concept of deity was that of a remote, all-powerful, all-perfect being, then prayer took the form of supplication or entreaty. But there were many times in our spiritual life when deity did not occupy this relationship to the human mind, when deity was not infallible, not infinitely remote. Deity was rather a very close and proximate being, with attitudes and temperament much like that of a human being. Under such conditions, man bargained with God. And there are a great many people today who do the same thing. They uh, sit down as they might uh, with another businessman and try to work it out, arbitrating some program uh, which can go all the way uh, from a most childish effort to barter and a means so dignified that its essential structure 
is lost sight of. If, for example, we light a candle when we pray, we are in a measure bargaining. We are making an offering for which we expect a dividend. If we say in our prayer, if this prayer is granted, I will do this, that, and the other thing, then we are also bargaining. I know many cases, actually, in which individuals have said, uh, by way of prayer, if you uh, will take this picture from me, I will be good from now on. This is bartering, although it is done in a nice way. Or if we say, if this misfortune is removed, uh, then I will contribute to some worthy charity. This type of uh, thinking and praying is not unfamiliar in our day. It represents the fact that we agree to give something if we get something. Now, this might look as though it was a rather nice modern invention, but it is really a fine old established custom among the Australian Bushmen. So we are not especially rare or rich in our particular attitude. At some time, also, we develop a kind of superiority complex in primitive days. And we began to take an attitude of man over nature, later to be developed into the concept of mind over matter. Well, that is exactly what its substance was. The belief that by demand, by one of a hundred different magical means, we could force our own will upon circumstances. Anciently, we hardly had the self-confidence to do this without some recourse to magic. But later, these magical methods became merely philosophical uh, conviction or defenses of policy. But we gradually developed this idea that we could change the outer surface or lightness of life by demand, supported in any way that we might feel that we are entitled to support these demands. Also in this time, we began to develop in early non-Christian faith this curious concept that man was a unique creature. This concept very distinctly and definitely influenced prayer. Uh, in the ancient times, particularly in the theologi uh, theological periods of history, man was not regarded as a generation emerging with nature. He was not the highest of the mammals, as we categorically classify him today. Man was something apart. The world was made for his convenience. The stars were hung in the sky so that he could see at night. Everything centered around man. All other creatures were merely to serve him. Uh, some to supply him their bodies for food or their skins for clothes. Man had no responsibility. He was a kind of a little autocrat uh, on a desert island in space, entitled to anything that he could get, and perfectly privileged to do as he pleased with everything he had. Now, it would be natural with this point of view that our attitude toward our needs would not be exactly reverent. More to the point was our general attitude that whenever we did not get what we wanted, some universal force was trying to cheat us out of our birthright. We were not uh, supposed necessarily to deserve anything. We were supposed to reach out and pick it from the tree. If some wind blew it off before we could pick it, and we were left without this particular desired object, then the bottom was out of the universe. And we turned to the universe not to ask, but in anger, to reprimand nature 
for having failed to provide us with what we wanted. Our attitude was therefore what we might call, call childish. We looked upon, the, upon nature as merely existing as a great mother servant for us to use as we please. It didn't take long to develop from this a rather highly evolved and involved ethical concept. Namely, that man was created by God with the right to have anything he wanted. If he didn't have it, it was simply because he hadn't asked for it loud enough and long enough. Also, if he was not able to enjoy all of this world's good, it was no matter of his own character, no problem involving defect in himself. He simply had not demanded what he wanted, and he had not gone out and taken it. This led, of course, to a number of complications, including the justification of war, rape, and pillage. It became more or less the basis of the more refined utterance of some of our, to the left of center political parties in the last century, the world owes me a living. The world owes us anything we want. And we may go as far as to say that certainly we should be entitled to it, but no matter what we get, would hardly pay for the inconvenience of being here in the first place. Actually, under such conditions, prayer uh, more or less merely became an affirmation of our own conviction about something. It lost all entreaty. It lost all sense of our own dependence or our own need. It simply became a positive statement of what we wanted. And then we waited breathlessly for it to arrive. If it did not arrive, we changed to another denomination that could deliver more quickly. These policies men have played with for thousands of years, trying to work out a proper and reasonable attitude uh, toward the needs of life and how to acquire them. Further than this, you have to realize that most ancient religions were polytheistic. And while we do not reasonably like to admit it, much of their philosophy and tradition has descended to us, to our own faith and to our philosophies built around different faiths. In polytheism, we began to develop the idea of specialized deities. Deities held control over certain attributes of nature. There were gods of all degrees and levels, visible and invisible. These deities had some relationship to a great over-hierarchy. Most of the more advanced religions assumed that this over-hierarchy was finally and ultimately suspended from a single divine power, but that deity, manifesting through creation, manifested through orders of life, many of these orders superior to our own, and constituting the hierarchies of St. Paul. It became, therefore, important uh, to worship certain deities for certain purposes or with certain ends in view. In ancient times, the guilds or the great corporations of workmen had their own deities. The god of medicine was peculiarly worshipped by the physician or by the sick seeking recovery. The god of harvest was also given his sacred days and his rites and rituals. Various deities ruled storms and rivers. There were gods of cities. And in the siege of Troy, we remember how the deities fought in heaven while the heroes combated on the earth below. Trades and professions, arts and crafts, 
all had their deity. And the primary responsibility of the member of each of these groups was to worship the deity of his group. He assumed that this deity would protect him against inroads from other deities or would see that his particular estate was protected for him. Out of this came gradually a thought of hierarchy of demigods, beings between men and the divine power above. These demigods and heroes could be prayed to, much as ancestors were. And of course in Greece and later in Rome, the rulers took on the divine prerogative, so that the emperor of Rome was not only the head of the state, but a deity, under the concept of emperor worship. The emperor, of course, was not the primary deity, not the great deity overall, but a deified mortal, like the emperor of China in the old days, or the Dalai Lama of Tibet a being sacrificed, set apart from other mortals, to whom prayers could be addressed, and who was believed to be able to actually um, produce or bestow spiritual benefits. Even in Europe, this habit continued throughout the period of absolute monarchy. And there are records of the divine right of kings as late as the 17th and 18th centuries. And the king, as the god physician, was um, an, an interesting phenomenon. We know that this is, uh, continued in England and Scotland down past the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. So that each year the king set aside a day in which the sick could come. And as he could not touch them all with the royal touch, which was not in that day a tax lien, but a benefit, the uh, king uh, prepared what were called touch coins, uh, resembling money, but created for a purpose. Uh, these were distributed to the sick after the king had blessed them or touched them himself. And these coins carried the benefit of the royal prerogative. And uh, in Scotland and Ireland today, these coins are cherished from one generation to another and have been used for sickness as late as the last two or three years. The belief that they had certain divine power descending from the divine right of kings, a right which was supposed to have been established in heaven. Naturally, the end of what you might term absolute monarchical autocracy, ended this concept very largely, although there are still vestiges of it in Japan and in some other countries, I am. The demigods began to disappear in the more enlightened concepts of religion to be, and to them were substituted, or for them, was substituted the Arhat in Buddhism, or the Lohan, the sanctified apostles, and in Christendom, uh, the apostles, the apostolic succession, and the canonization of saints. The saint being, in most instances, associated with some peculiar virtue which could be attained through supplicating that saint. Therefore, prayers to saints uh, were for particular purposes or to attain some special end associated with the life or martyrdom of that saint. But it has been universally held in uh, the older forms of Christianity that these sanctified persons uh, could and did intercede uh, for the true believers, and the prayers addressed to them might be answered. 
Thus we have so many different variations of the prayer theme that we have to recognize that each of these differences affects to some degree the attitude of the person praying, involving a different kind of concept as to the right to pray, the correct manner to pray, and the attitude that we should take if the prayer is not answered. In the penitenti villages of New Mexico, the little saints, the little wooden figures of the saints that are called uh, the bultos, or wooden figure, uh, are prayed to. One of the most uh, familiar of these little saints in the homes of these primitive worshippers is San Jose, or St. Joseph. And it is not uncommon to find that if this saint does not answer the prayer that is asked of him, he is punished by having his face turned to the wall for several weeks until he repents of his thoughtlessness and indifference. It is necessary to punish the saint because he did not do what we wanted him to. This tendency to punish the saint survives more subtly in a great many of our attitudes today. Prayer also involves a very profound psychological question began at the very beginning. And that is, how does it happen that all prayers are not answered? We can abstractly theologize on this subject and try to explain why ten persons whose prayers are answered will be followed by ten more whose prayers are not answered. Uh, a very serious situation of this nature can surround some famous healing shrine like that at Lourdes in France. If the sick person goes to Lourdes and is healed, it is a wonderful evidence of divine uh, blessing. But supposing he is not healed. The philosophy of prayer must be large enough to explain this peculiarity. And this peculiarity, obviously, was noticeable from the very beginning. Sometimes prayers produced the desired results. Sometimes they did not. Now, there were many explanations offered for these differences. Uh, some uh, groups uh, held uh, that the deities to whom they prayed uh, were too much like themselves. Therefore, that these deities did not answer prayer because they didn't like the person who prayed, or because the person did not put out the right offering on the little table before the spirit of the deity. That there was some mistake in the rite or the ritual some error in formula, some important detail had been overlooked, some ancient and mysterious formula had been misinterpreted, and for such causes the prayer was not answered. But out of it all came the final development of man's guilt mechanism. It ultimately came to be rather obvious to him uh, that his own prayers were not always honest. And he began to suspect that his own integrity had something to do with whether or not uh, the prayer was answered. And in the rise of Christianity and in more recent uh, centuries, the emphasis has been upon the element of faith. The individual whose faith is not strong will not receive benefit. The individual whose faith is great will receive benefit. And on this, uh, the faith also rests upon the testimony of Jesus in the gospel. So that the answering of prayer depends upon the attitude of the person praying. Whether this attitude is sincere, whether it is morally right, whether the prayer is morally and spiritually good, 
whether the person is asking for something that is contrary to his real spiritual need. If his prayer is selfish, if it is ulterior in its motive, if his own attitude is not sincere, then perhaps this will explain why the prayer is not answered. But there became further evidence that apparently the most sincere persons were not successful. And uh, we come into the same problem that has beset us ethically for a long time. Why is it that the sincere seem to suffer, whereas the insincere uh, flourish like the green bay tree? This apparently led to the conclusion that there had to be elements present in the entire formula of man's existence that were beyond his understanding. Therefore, in the presence of mystery, which appeared to be unjust or unreasonable, man could only take the attitude that his own ignorance prevented him from understanding, and that actually only deity itself who knew what was truly good. And these things rested with the arbitrary power of God to grant or deny, first according to his pleasure and later according to the laws and principles which he represented. This brings again another situation to uh, common thought. And that is the structure of the prayer form as we know it now and as it anciently developed. Prayer was, as we have said, originally non-directed. It was the dance, the ritual, the chant, and the song. It was the individual fulfilling certain, certain ancient rituals associated with magic and calculated to bring the results that were required. Later, this ritualism which was really only possible when man had a certain uh, ethical concept toward nature. This ritualism uh, took on greater ceremonial proportions and became directed as man began to sense the rising of a great spiritual power at the root of existence. When man became conscious of a God separate and apart from his own concept, when he began to realize the existence of a universal parent principle above and beyond the small and passing interests of man, then the relationship of the dance and the magical formula uh, to this deity changed, and we begin to find the rise of the spirit of entreaty we find man trying to bridge the interval between his own existence and this measureless and immense life in space. Man only believed that the final residing place of the supreme power was space, the air around him. If deity was all-knowing and all-aware, and deity was all available at all times, then this deity had to be a zonic. It had to be a power that did not reside in one place, but resided everywhere. It had to be something near but unseen. And as the Incas of Peru realized it, uh, they performed a religious ritual of honoring God by kissing the air as an indication that they believed it to be his residing place or where they could reach to him. Thus words spoken into the air, songs sung into the air, dancing with uh, music, the beating of drums, vibrating through the air. These were means of communicating with the divine power. Also incense and smoke of offering rising into the air was raised and lifted up unto the nostrils of the Most High. So deity dwelt in the air dimension, 
in a dimension beyond our sight, but always near to us. In this same concern, man gradually polarized his concept of the world in which he lived. In the Chaldean time, Babylonian, early Egyptian, Phoenician, ancient Chinese, in all these old times, man began to divide the world between an upper and lower region of air or place. Nature, the earth, mortality, man, always implied the concept of down. Man looked down to the earth, and when his life was over, he went down to sleep in the earth. Man looked up into space. Space was mystery. Space was filled with remote and wonderful things like stars. In the air above him, the sun marked its ancient course. In the air above him also, the clouds came. The air was light, the earth was dark. Light came with day, darkness came with night. And by degrees, man instinctively developed this concept of the upness of superior things and the downness of inferior things. Way back in the days of the Chaldeans and Phoenicians, therefore, men lifted up their eyes unto the hills from whence cometh their strength. Many primitive people believed that their gods dwelt upon mountains or in the high places of the Lord, even as it was upon a mountain that God spake unto Moses. So mountains and mountain worship became very sacred. And the concept of the world mountain, whether it be Olympus or Miru or Sumuru, these mountains, like Kalasa, the abode of the gods of India, had at their tops and highest parts invisible temples, forever clouded, and hidden from the view of men, where dwelt the immortals. Men thus, thus began to pray upward. They began to raise their hands in supplication. They began to address the air, or the sun, or like the devout Muslim, they faced Mecca and raised their hands to the sky. This raising of the hands was a salutation, a greeting, a calling upon the air to bear witness. And even today in many religious groups, it is customary to raise the face in prayer, as though looking with the eyes closed into some place in space. On the other side of the story, humility, penance, of man's recognition of his own sinful and imperfect nature may cause him to hang his head in shame. Therefore, prayer in which the head is lowered is inclined to indicate humility, regret for offense, humbleness, and that the individual hangs his head as a criminal before the judge because he has sinned because he is asking for forgiveness for the frailties and limitations of the flesh. These moods became gradually psychological. No longer do we actually associate them with any conscious action. We simply fall into traditional forms and formulas. Things have always been done this way. Therefore, we continue to do them this way. Prayer, however, gradually divides in our thinking between man raising his eyes to the light, a man hanging his head in despondency and chagrin. These two moods have always distinguished the basic elements of our attitude toward prayer in religion. Beginning with the Protestant Reformation, there has been a drift away of the churches 
from the use of prayer as an instrument of healing. We know, for example, that the early church regarded among the explicit instructions of the master to his disciples his word, heal the sick. For the last 500 years, however, such healing has been either through the intercession of saints or through uh, sacred places like Lourdes or the shrine at Guadalupe or perhaps in a lesser measure through congregational prayer, sometimes included in Protestant services when a member of the congregation is stricken. But the formal concept of religion as a healing agency and the development of the admonition of the master to his followers. Uh, these procedures have been generally and almost totally neglected. One of the reasons for the neglect has probably been the rapid rise of our materialistic sciences and also the rapid division between the arts of medicine and religion. In ancient times there was no such division and therefore the priest and the physician were frequently the same person. More recently, however, the division has not only been clearly marked, but a powerful antagonism has arisen between these two groups. And with the rise of science, uh, the attitude of learning in general has not favored the continuance of any mystical type of healing. Man has been uh, taught to depend more and more upon the pharmacopoeia, upon scientific methods of combating disease. I imagine that in the course of the perspective of future centuries, we will find that the 19th century of our era was the dividing line. For in the 19th century, materialism sort of hit bottom. It descended as far as it could into a state of sophisticated isolation. Learning separated itself from almost every intuitional and mystical attribute of human character. We became so fascinated with the exactness of scientific procedure, we forgot that this exactness can be and usually was extremely sterile. It's not much comfort to us to know the exact reason why things go wrong. But what we are more concerned with is the exact method by which we can set them right. It consequently follows that we learned a great many facts, but many of these facts had little effect upon our happiness, our health, or our peace of mind. But the broad attitude which accompanied this factual approach, worked a hardship on all. It worked a hardship upon our health as well as upon our internal conviction. So by the end of the 19th century, we began to revise our thinking. And with the rise of psychology, we entered into a new era of interpretation concerning things once held as religious or mystical or mysterious. It gradually dawned upon us that all of the reports of the past dealing with the power of prayer, that these were not all imaginary. Of course, in the medieval period, we always had the devil to blame for trouble. We are gradually disposed of him, but we are still in trouble which indicates that probably he was not the cause in the first place. Actually, uh, the mysteries that we could not understand were not infernal, demoniacal, or due to some extraordinary uh, magical formula. These mysteries were simply the result of man being what he was. And among these mysteries, it became evident that there was a scientific means of explaining why prayer helped people to get well. 
So this, however, was a sort of mixed blessing in itself, because psychology was, especially at that time, itself tightly held in the bonds of materialism. The psychologist simply elevated the mystery of prayer to the level of mental phenomena. But he did accomplish one very useful end. He proved conclusively that this mental phenomena was valid, that it accomplished its purposes, and that it was perfectly possible for an individual to enjoy almost miraculous changes in his condition and estate as a result of the positive statement of faith in his own consciousness. The psychologist at that time might question whether this faith itself was justified or not, but they could not doubt that the faith, when firmly held, produced positive results. This, however, still left the whole subject as one no longer of magic, but of auto-suggestion of the individual influencing his own conduct and setting up a pattern whereby through the increased confidence given to him by the belief in prayer and by the survival of the magical ritual of addressing his needs to the mysterious air around him, that actually he was helped, that something happened, things changed. And the psychologist said, yes, they changed, but the change was due to the change in you. Now, this was not quite as materialistic as it first appeared, because if we will remember and go back to religious origins, particularly of our own faith and the more prominent religions of other people, all good things were reserved in religious doctrine for those who did change themselves. St. Paul refers to those who are the firstborn of them that sleep. He describes those that are born again in Christ. But the individual passes through certain ex internal experiences. And if he is sanctified by these experiences, if he is impelled to a new degree of inner integrity, he gains thereby a certain power over circumstances. Psychology uh, toyed with this idea. It, however, held mostly and largely to the conclusion that it was the intensity of the attitude rather than the validity of it which produced the result desired. And the, as one defense for this position, uh, the psychologist pointed out, that while we regard our faith as so and true and proper, we also have very grave doubts about the accuracy of other people's believing. Yet other people, having other believing, also have their prayers answered. And just as many pagans have had their prayers answered as Christians, just as many Buddhists as Hindus, just as many Chinese as Jews. Therefore, prayer to be answered does not necessarily imply that we have to belong to one religion or one theological system, even though we sometimes wish to deny the validity of these other systems and insist theologically that the followers of them are deluded. Still, these deluded people have just as good luck with their prayers as we do. And it is also notable that the rain falls upon both the just and the unjust. Thus, we have a further situation to consider. And psychology left this side of it rather flat. They admit it, and we will all acknowledge with them that an individual moved by a conviction is changed, and is changed from within himself. And there is no conviction that can move him more than the conviction that God is on his side. There are not many of us who follow Abraham Lincoln's 
recommendation to find out whether or not we are on God's side. We assume that because we assume as two children that our parent wants us to be happy. Therefore, whatever makes us happy, God will bestow. It is adolescent, but we still cling to it. Realizing that strength of mind over matter and the strength of mind over our own conduct or over our own attitude will produce marked changes in the chemistry of our relationship. The mentalist began to study prayer as mental phenomena, as suggestion, auto-suggestion, and almost hypnosis. The element of prayer as magic was, of course, eliminated at this stage of the thinking. So the point was developed very strongly that the individual who was uh, without center, who was in chaos or confused or disoriented, such an individual would, if through prayer, he could regain a certain sense of centeredness, immediately begin to free himself from difficulty. He would find his association with other people more pleasant. And because he became a better organized and more direct and clear-thinking person, innumerable problems began to clear. And among other problems, naturally, is economic situation, which has been the subject of a great deal of prayer in the last hundred years, uh, began to improve and clear up also. All he had to do was to convince himself of certain things. He had to convince himself that God wanted him to be happy. He had to convince himself that God wanted him to be rich. He also had to convince himself that God wanted him to be healthy. If he could achieve these ends in form of conviction, then he was in a good way uh, to achieve many of the things which he desired. Ethically, the weakness in the whole situation lies in the fact we have no evidence that deity wants these things. We assume, however, that because deity is good, deity wants us to have what we want. The question as to whether this is good or not does not come into the subject of that. What we want must be good. What we do not want must be bad. Thus, for many years, prayer and associated religious contrivances began to get rather selfish and essentially self-centered. Psychology began to experience the reaction of this in its own cases. It discovered that people, taking various attitudes which are comparable to prayer, and intensely expecting, which was this phase, no longer beseeching, but expecting, that when these people got what they expected, they merely got more trouble. It did not work out well. The individual believed he had found a magic formula for success. But this success did not touch himself. This success was without humility. It was a, without this basic beseeching which was so large an element in the entire history of prayer from the very meaning of the word itself. The word prayer does not mean demand. It means to entreat, to beg, to ask. But through various philosophies, we elevated ourselves to such a near kinship with God that it was no longer necessary for us to beseech anything. We could talk it all over man to man. That was our trouble. In trying to raise ourselves up, we pulled God down until we were finally confronted again with this arbitration problem, this problem of variously bargaining for the things which we wanted. And this bargaining went right on into the present century. Psychology, therefore, came to the realization gradually 
the prayer as we had been popularly practicing it was not essentially therapeutic. It did not result in healing. It did not change the person. It merely permitted him to use one group of faculties more intensely than he had previously used them, and from this greater intensity to achieve certain distinct and greater results. It being assumed, of course, that these results were right and proper, and that the development of these faculties was the reasonable and normal way by which man grew and unfolded. With the beginning of the 20th century, new dimensions again came in. Psychology began to drift away from its utter materialism. It began to break into smaller schools, and some of these schools are still segmenting. They are still breaking into still smaller groups and divisions. Others are clustering around new central concepts. But out of it all is gradually emerging probably the most philosophical attitude that we have in general today, namely that there can be no permanent improvement in man without certain interior changes in man. If the individual simply cannot will his way to reality or will his way to safety, he may be able to add to his means, he may be able to force himself into some situation not otherwise immediately available. But regardless of where he goes, what he does, what he has, he still remains pathetically what he is. And what he is is not satisfactory to anyone involved in this problem. In the last 25 years, wars and depressions have resulted in a strong restatement of basic religious conviction. And in the last ten years particularly, the reintroduction of healing into the structure of Christian religion founded upon the premise that it is possible for man to establish an intimate relationship with the presence of divinity in his own consciousness. More advanced people become in the prayer phenomena, the less likely they are to turn this prayer toward changing outside things. The more likely they are to cause this prayer to be a means of fortifying their spiritual resolution to become better people. The prayer mystery, as we find it in the early Gospels, is that its purpose is to inspire the person to be better. And by the healing of the illnesses in his own psychic nature, to relieve himself of the outward manifestation of these illnesses in the form of misery, sorrow, and pain. Thus the man who conquers himself, who establishes his own spiritual integration, becomes, in a sense, uh, superior to the problems uh, which exist around him, but not because he has taken an autocratic or despotic attitude toward these problems and resolved or demanded that they be removed. The next question that arises with this whole situation is also clarifying itself gradually as man's general knowledge enlarges. Is prayer, as we know it, as a simple and devout statement, is pr prayer a force? Does it have a validity, a dynamic of its own? Is it merely something that man strengthens with his own determination, with his faith, and with his acceptance? Or does prayer phenomena actually have a living vitality of its own? At the turn of the century, the scientific mind would have rejected such a possibility almost completely. 
now even the more hardened scientist is not quite so sure. And the tendency today is to admit that there may be a definite vitality in the prayer procedure if that procedure is correct and if the elements involving the process are right in themselves and according to the laws governing such phenomena in life, laws which we do not understand too well, but one of which apparently, at least dimly, is to be perceived by us, namely that selfishness makes all things go bad, that we are beginning to sense beyond any reasonable doubt. The rest is not quite so clear. Nothing has contributed more to the recognition of the possible existence of a spiritual energy or vitality in space than the development in radio and the consequent development in television. Here we have come face to face with the reality of an invisible energy that is not only present, but when the proper equipment is established, can be caused uh, to reaffirm itself, either through sound or through uh, visibility. Thus we have now the proof that we do not have to see a thing in order to say it is there. Invisible energies and rays that we now know exist move through this room. And though we cannot see them, we cannot deny them. Thus, the possibility of the reality of invisible has been brought very strongly home to us. Another department of thinking has also added to this, and that has been gradual experimentation in the field of psychic phenomena. This experimentation, as expressed, through the extrasensory perception researches of several men, has come to be of general interest, not only to the layman, but to the scientist. And there is a large group of scientists today convinced that extrasensory perception is true. And that means the reality of varying degrees of clairvoyance thought transmission and the projection of thought to persons or conditions at a distance and the anticipation in the mind or in the consciousness of events which have not yet occurred. These and other forms indicate a larger area of human experience than we have per previously recognized. Thought transference in itself means that the mental energy of an individual can be transferred to another individual or can be picked up as in the case of a radio wave and that the second person or the receiver can reorganize this thought impulse into its original meaning and register it so upon his own consciousness. If there be, therefore, any transmission of energy from one person to another along lines of mental or in, uh, emotional intensity, then we have every reason to assume the power of collective mental energy upon any situation or condition that arises. We also realize that the more powerful a broadcasting station, the wider its range, the clearer its image, and the more it is likely to overcome the interference of weaker stations. We therefore also recognize the accumulative power of collective thought and the possibility that this accumulative power can be responsible for a number of phenomena which we have been attempting rather inadequately to explain in other ways. We also have a reason and considerable evidence to support the concept 
that cumulative or individual thought is not nearly as perishable as we assume. A thought that moves out from us into space does not necessarily evaporate. Thought in all possibilities may survive the body, and the thoughts of men may factually and actually live long after them, not on printed pages or in the memories of others, but as living forces in the world itself. So if the recent researchers continue as they have, and there is every reason to assume they will, there seems no slowing of the pace. In fact, it is getting more exhilarated continuously. We are moving into a universe in which the exchange of mental and emotional energy by projection of thought and feeling may well become an orthodox and well-known fact. If such occurs, then we have the logical and proper ground for realizing that this means of communication or this means of dissemination of ideas, thoughts, or knowledge is not limited to experimental endeavors, but that across this interval, these waves can transmit innumerable types of impact and that this impact will be received not merely as a do-so or do-not-so impulse, but as a very powerful experience impulse. Uh, the extrasensory gamut form of communication may ultimately result in the possibility of the communication of experience or the communication of the factual living of events. But the individual will not listen or look, but will feel totally within himself and will therefore actually experience what others have experienced. This actual communication of experience may well be the beginning of real understanding between human beings. Burbank once told me that he was quite certain that plants and flowers could be affected by human attitudes of varying degrees of intensity. Because of his natural instinct, and because although a devout man, he was an untheological man, and was therefore regarded as an agnostic, Mr. Burbank held firmly the power of communion between man and nature. He insisted and told me very firmly that he completely believed that plants and probably animals, not able to understand or even hear the words that we spoke, or not having any knowledge of the type of vocabulary, or the meaning of our word dimensions in life, we're able to receive telepathically a clear insight as to our meaning that other kingdoms contacted us on the level of meaning, whereas we contact on the level of words. He insisted, therefore, that he could commune with plants and they would obey him. And he proved it. And he insisted that his entire research was based almost entirely upon a conscious cooperation between the plant and himself. That we, that we as he said, work together to achieve the end which had been desi decided to be desirable. That with patience and coaxing and explanation, he made these plants understand what he wants, and he found them amazingly willing to cooperate, perhaps even more so than average human beings. Recently, experiments have been made of the effect of prayer upon the growth of vegetation, and the results up to this time, though not conclusive and not completely organized as far as the adequate data is concerned, 
would seem to be positive, namely that prayer will hasten the growth of plants. Now, does this mean that it is prayer that is doing it? Or is it, again, this communication on an extrasensory perception level? Is it communication? Is it transfer of energy? Is it man bestowing a certain vitality from himself upon that plant, establishing the rapport between himself and the plant through the conscious focusing of his attention thereon? What is the source of the energy that flows to the plant as the result of prayer? Is this energy actually bestowed by deity? Is this energy made available to man by some mystical or magical pattern of prayer? Or is it the result of man's own communication of life purpose or life meaning to the other kingdom? The talking dogs of Vima a number of years ago seemed to prove beyond doubt that animals could maintain a fair level of logic, that animals were concerned interiorly with the same problems that we are concerned with but do not have any means of expressing this to us, unless through some unusual training with an exceptional animal we are able to establish some symbolic means of exact communication. This was accomplished with these dogs. And these dogs, when asked reasonable questions, answered them reasonably, even though they had had no previous instruction on the subject. Some might hold that the dogs were reading the mind of the person, that they merely picked up our own thinking. This, again, has not been clearly uh, proven one way or another. But if they could pick up this thing, there is no reason to assume that other animals cannot pick it up or that other kingdoms cannot pick it up. Thus we may find ourselves moving into a universe in which the transmission of pure thought or the transmission of psychic energy and the transmission therewith of certain purposes, certain degrees or levels of understanding but such transmission is within perhaps a comparatively short period of years of being achieved and fulfilled by man. There is also evidence that man's interior mental and brain structure are suitable for such acceptance and such transmission, and that there are undoubtedly areas in the brain available for new functional purposes beyond any that we know at the present time. Let us then assume for a moment what is now not a rash assumption anymore, that the more intense an attitude is held emotionally or mentally, the more likely that attitude is to have an effect outside of the limited area of the person holding the attitude. That the person holding the attitude may be also internally strengthened or may come to a new orientation in his own nature. But the energy of his will, whether this energy be transmuted or still upon a comparatively base level of uh, ethics, can be communicated. Therefore, selfishness can be communicated, greed can be communicated, hate can be communicated. The development of a means of more intimate and conscious acceptance of this uh, psychic energy also implies the great need for the refinement of this energy itself with the hope that it will not result in the communication of attitudes which are destructive to the common good. That such negative communication has been achieved also seems rather evident from the long course of history. And we observe that certain attitudes have been 
was tremendously communicated and have resulted in the most tragic consequences to all concerned. In modern religion, therefore, and in a metaphysical and mystical group, the circles or groups gathering for prayer or for meditation or for some internal resource development are becoming more commonly discussed and known. Groups of persons in all parts of the world, for example, are uniting as never before in prayer for peace, in the supplication of the divine power to bring security and the end of war and evil. All over the world also, groups are praying for help and maintaining prayer circles to assist those distressed in many ways through the problems of the day. Testimonials flow into these groups continuously. A few years ago, we would have regarded these testimonials with considerable reservation. We would have said that too many of them are probably merely self-hypnosis. And still, a great many of them probably are. But there is still a group to be explained, and this explanation problem cannot be evaded. There is reason to believe that a right attitude held by a group of persons can be felt and experienced. The great problem is to make sure that the attitude is right. The rightness of this attitude must be measured by the basic integrity of its educational communication. And we do not mean by education in this sense of uh, doctrine. We mean that the impact of this energy upon the life or lives of those who are receptive to it, that this impact must be essentially right. We do not want to find ourselves in this, in the same predicament we are in in television. The average child today spends from 20 to 30 hours a week in front of television. It has become the greatest single force in his life because of his receptivity to it. It is actually a larger moral force in his life than his parents or his school. Yet what is coming across these waves is far from desirable in the majority of cases. And when we start the transmission of pure mental energy, we may be subject to exactly the same difficulty. We don't want the strong-minded criminal contributing to the general delinquency of all mankind. Yet how are we going to reduce or release these barriers which protect us from the mental lives of other people without being influenced by the bad as well as by the good, without receiving negative uh, waves of vibration as well as positive waves. Always these discoveries become a new challenge to our own integrity. We have failed miserably in the television challenge. Can we ex be expected to do any better on a telepathic level? There could be nothing more disastrous than the breaking down of our barriers by means of which we protect ourselves from mental energies which we cannot digest. There could be nothing more tragic than to break down such barriers and expose us naked to our enemies, which would be just about as serious as the lying in the Shakespearean play of Henry VIII would indicate. This means two things. We cannot prevent the motions of progress. But every progress becomes a burden to our spirit, just exactly as the development of atomic has brought with it a terrible fear that is wrenching at our hearts and souls. Any enlargement of our faculty perception will not guarantee the integrity of those perceptions. We may develop and intensify faculty, but this does not mean that we dedicate them. 
or that they are bound to principles able to preserve and protect them. Thus, each new step forward becomes a dilemma, and we move from one dilemma to another down through the course of history. To answer this question thoroughly means to review the whole story of man's moral life. This we cannot do at the moment, but we can perhaps emphasize its particular relation to prayer problem as we sense or see it today. Prayer has two essential purposes, and we cannot divide them completely. Assuming that man, as he now experiences his needs, is seeking through prayer to achieve a mood, he is seeking to restore, by means of prayer phenomena, a positive relationship between himself and life. He is attempting to enter a state of conscious rapport with reality, with the eternal principle for which uh, philosophy has given such terms as spirit, consciousness, truth, being, essence. Man through prayer seeks a correct relationship between himself and eternity. This correct relationship, so far as he can experience it today, is one of gentle humility. The recognition of his own need, the recognition of his own imperfection, the realization that up to the present time he has never known enough to be inspired to a common, united action in harmony with truth. He has never had sufficient realization to understand why he was here. He's never had sufficient courage to live according to the essential principles that he does understand. Therefore, his need at the moment is so real, and his own position is so inadequate, that as far as facts and essence are concerned, he is in a position of entreaty. He is not asking, however, to be saved from himself. He is not asking to be preserved in violation to law. He is asking to have the insight, the understanding, and the spiritual integrity to know what is right and do it. Therefore, his prayer is that he shall be conscious of the divine plan as it relates to him and to those of his kind and to nature around him. He asks that he may have insight into the law, which is the will of God for its creatures. And out of this insight, he asks also the internal moral support, which will assist him to live what he knows and to keep the faith that he discovers. Such kind of internal prayer, silent prayer perhaps, meditational prayer, is consequently intended to create a mood in him, a movement of his own spiritual nature, a relaxation away from worldliness, a temporary separation from outwardness and from all the pressures and selfishness which moves the external world around us. He has to have the power to know, which means that he has to become receptive. He has to beseech. He has to ask. He has to need. He has to pass through certain experiences in which he comes finally to realize that without interior strength his cause is lost, and that this strength must come from a power superior to himself. This recognition, this relaxation toward God, 
is expressed by means of entreaty. Not by groveling, not by uh, the same abjection as which, with which the ancient people mutilated themselves before the altars of their gods, but certainly a dignified and gentle statement of real need and of earnest desire to meet that need and the recognition that the supply for the meeting of that need must come from a divine source. Thus, entering into a comparatively relaxed state, the person opens himself to the inflow of a mystical energy which up to now he has not recognized and not permitted to have its perfect work in him. His own mind and his own attitudes also become sources of energy movement. And he locks himself by his attitude creating walls of defensive energy through which the natural motion of life cannot come. Opinions, attitudes, prejudices, these are actual living walls of energy, negative energy. And these walls not only keep out the enemy, but also keep out the life which is the eternal friend. Thus we have to relax against this opinionation, this self-sufficiency, this belief that with our abilities, with our sciences, with our art, with our craft, with our policies, we can defeat the unknown. These uh, ends, or this end, we cannot achieve. So in our prayerfulness, we simply attempt to attune ourselves to an energy which is everywhere in space and is eternally available. If we can experience this, this peace, this calmness, this quietness, then it is possible through extrasensory uh, transmission to project it or to create a condition by which another person can become aware on a level that better than that of exterior communication alone. Here we fall directly into the Zen concept. For over a thousand years, the masters of Zen have communicated the doctrine without speaking, nor have they made use of symbols, or have they had their disciples read the instructions. The communication is entirely psychic. It is the communication of the experience of one person, the master experience, transmitted inwardly to his disciples as a series of experiences. And these fragments of experiences are symbolically concealed behind the title of the koan, which is actually a fragment, a fragment of impact of energy between the master and the disciple. If it is possible, therefore, to communicate a doctrine by the ability of transmission by the mind alone, how is this done? If the master mind, the teacher, the Zen master, projected a positive, dramatic, uh, despotic attitude, he could overcome his disciples' resistance by something resembling oratory, if it was spoken word, or by debate, or by dispute, or by the hypnotic force of a command which could not be resisted. All of such methods are wrong and would never be used in the transmission of true experience. The purpose that is necessary is that both the master and the disciple reach a condition of the complete transcendence of themselves, the complete suspension of their own personal attitude, and in this way suddenly experience that they always have been in communication. The thing that prevented the expression of the communication was consisted of two separate patterns of attitude which in their aggressive form could not be communicated. 
when both attitudes, that of the receiving person and of the sending person, when both attitudes are held in complete suspension, reality moves freely through these channels, and pure consciousness mingles with pure consciousness resulting in a common experience. And it is this experience in common which is the real end toward which mystical meditation and prayer have always aimed. The purpose of prayer being this mingling of personal consciousness with a universal source of true strength and integrity and mingling for no ulterior motive whatsoever. Not a mingling in order that we can get well from sickness, or that we can exchange poverty for wealth, or that we can dispose of unnecessary and unwelcome relations. These are not the ends of prayer. The purpose is to establish a mood of complete correctness, of such utter and inevitable rightness in ourselves that all of the attitudes which we hold wrongly no longer continue to operate. With this condition, we remove the cause of misery. For the cause of misery is the interval between man and God. And as man through mystical experience attains the consciousness of being. That consciousness has in it nothing of selfishness and nothing of self-purpose. It is universal purpose moving into manifestation, with man accepting with gratitude and gentleness that which the infinite in its wisdom eternally provides. Prayer in this sense, then, becomes the possibility of re-establishing the ancient mystical bridge, and as such becomes a very prominent and positive force in healing. Healing is actually achieved in most instances by the correction of a root cause in man. Now it is not possible nor expected that man shall achieve all things quickly. As one old sage pointed out, man has to die many times in order to learn how to live once. But the fact remains that much can gradually be achieved by proper degrees, but not by force and pressure. Thus, in uh, prayer therapy, the purpose is to change the relationship of the individual towards his energy problem. The great thing to be achieved as, as possible is to bring to this person the power or the experience of peace, the experience of acceptance, the experience of recognizing that the interior contrition of his own consciousness is his prayer. True prayer is to live in the state of prayerfulness. And this state of prayerfulness is the state of the eternal acceptance of God. A man cannot hope at this time to live in that state continuously. But he can hope to experience it occasionally as Plotinus did. He can hope that one or two mystical experiences in the course of a lifetime may so consecrate him that he shall know the truth of all things. Not because he rationalizes it, but because he experiences it by the complete act of faith. It would be quite conceivable, therefore, that prayer in the churches and in religious organizations could gradually become a very powerful and purposeful branch of therapy. The very least that could be accomplished is that prayer would be a handmaiden upon the sciences, that they would prepare the individual for the mystery of his own recovery. They would prepare him to accept 
whatever services were necessary on the part of science, without prejudice, without conceit, without overestimation or underestimation. And nothing could be of greater value uh, to the sincere physician than a sincere patient who has the proper attitude with which to approach the improvement of health. The physician today has not only to fight with the bodily ills, but with the whole chain of psychic complaints, which are largely responsible for many ailments that now seem to arise within the flesh itself. No medication on the outside can solve these psychic complaints. The psychologist tries to solve them, but something essentially important is missing. And that something in the patient's experience is veneration. The patient may respect the psychologist, but he does not have the proper emotional outlet. The only emotional outlet that he may develop is dangerous, and that's transference, in which he will become overly personally attached to his physician. What he needs is a true emotional relief. And this true emotional relief comes through the relaxation of his psychic life into the beautiful experience of something valuable. If the person can come to believe and know that he has the power to take a correct attitude toward God, and that this correct attitude has been called prayer, it is the complete a relaxation of himself away from the world and the acceptance into himself of the full impact of universal truth or principle. Through prayer, man experiences this to a measure. He experiences a little relaxation. He senses the importance of quietness, even when he gathers with others in church, the quiet moments of prayer. Give him a sense of belonging, not merely to this world, but to the whole universe, which is the religious mystery. And in these quiet moments, there is a natural refreshment. There is a relief from psychic stress. There is a temporary suspension of worldliness. Through the continual development of prayer, this experience can be largened. It can be made more continuous and more important. It can, however, also lead us to certain escape mechanisms which we must protect ourselves against. We are not supposed to take away from our daily work vast amount of time to use in beseeching deity. What we are supposed to do is to discover also that in our work is our prayer, and that prayer is a general attitude toward everything that we do, in which every action, thought, and emotion becomes an offering upon the altar of eternal truth. If we can achieve this type of realization, sickness will have a tendency to clear. Many ailments that have nothing but tension as a cause will very quickly respond. Ailments which perhaps have already become so chronic that they have affected the flesh, although they might have been of psychic beginnings, may respond more slowly. But that which cannot be cured can then be carried with dignity, with understanding and with patience and with a full realization that we live in a just universe, and that the things that are happening to us are the natural results of our own conduct. If we then take this more relaxed, honorable position, we can do a great deal. If groups of persons taking this attitude meet together for common purpose, there can now apparently be no doubt that the single effort is intensified. And that is persons with a correct attitude and a correct understanding, if enough of them did unite in prayer, there would ultimately be peace. 
not only because they pray together, but because the prayer must so affect them that they can no longer fight each other. The prayer, therefore, is not only a beseeching of God to bestow peace, but the very beseeching is the winning of peace in ourselves. Therefore, when we ask God to bestow love, we ask a strange uh, question, or to make a strange request, because actually deity is love. Therefore, can never deprive anything of its own nature. What we are asking is that we may experience it. And the only reason we do not experience it is ourselves. Thus, prayer must create the mood, the mood of receptivity. It is not only the supplication, but the bridge, by means of which the supplication can be caused to achieve its own end or proper purpose. Prayer can help the individual who is sick because it will take away from him the rebellion, the tension, and the stress. It will help him to carry with serenity what problems of recuperation he must pass through. Prayer will help the person who is alone to escape the neurosis of loneliness, because prayer gives us the experience that we cannot be alone that loneliness is isolation due to our own false thinking. Little by little, the receptivity to prayer, the acceptance of it into our own consciousness becomes therapy. We gradually achieve a state of vibration in which we relax the false tensions of our own energy. And into this quietude, uh, can flow the experience which we have previously locked out by our own aggressive and non-effective um, feelings. Most of us, to a measure, are rebels. Rebellion is our common experience. We fight against that which hurts us. We arm ourselves against the unknown. We struggle desperately by all kinds of aggressive means to achieve purposes which we desire. We live and die of our own aggressiveness, and today we suffer greatly because of it. This aggressiveness locks us away from the quiet world of all things that are so. It makes us fight for something that is already so close to us that we cannot see it. It makes us strive desperately for distant benefits, when the greatest benefit is at our very door. It makes us strive to find happiness in all the things around us, uncertain though they be, and denies us of the experience of knowing true happiness by communion with the thing within us. So prayer can set many of these problems right for us. And the development of it as a means of therapy is legitimate. It is another level. Psychology works with the problems of the mind. Prayer is a therapy for the heart. And as the heart must ever rule the mind by the very nature of man, that which goes into the deeper part of him as the greatest benefit. So there will sometime be a complete religious mysticism of transmutation, or the transforming of man's inner life through these mystical sacraments, of which prayer is probably one of the most common and familiar. So we, we do feel that prayer today is a vital force, and the more completely it is disseminated, the more it may achieve its end, and the more it will accomplish the reformation of the one who prays. For out of the true and earnest experience of prayer, man comes to a better life than he may previously have known. And once having enjoyed it, he will sustain it to the best of his ability. Thank you very much.